Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. Infectious diseases have plagued humans since the beginning of time, and the arrival of a new contagion brings uncertainty, confusion, and the race for a vaccine. The experiences of severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2003, H1N1 bird flu in 2009, Ebola in 2014, and now the Zika virus in 2016 are the most recent example of threats targeting the public health. Groups such as the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization rush to address these threats, and the media are quick to label them epidemics, raising fears on the part of the public. But are these fears realistic? Has media overreaction become the norm in reporting on infectious disease? And just how should the public react to these outbreaks? These are some of the questions we'll examine in this edition of Physician Focus with Dr. Stephen Hatch. Dr. Hatch is an infectious disease specialist at UMass Memorial Medical Center in Worcester and an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Disease at UMass Medical School. In 2014, he spent five weeks in Liberia with the International Medical Corps, treating patients stricken with Ebola, subsequently returning multiple times to that country to treat patients. He is the author of the just published book, Snowball in a Blizzard, a physician's note on uncertainty in medicine. Welcome, Dr. Hatch. Thanks for having me. Well, um, this all came about because you gave a superb lecture at St. Vincent Hospital. And the thing that struck me at that um, lecture was a comment that you made. And that was the point where you said you felt more comfortable uh, suited up in 100 degree heat and 100 percent humidity millimeters away from patients infected with Ebola, giving them a back rub or whatever, than you did on returning to the United States. And I thought that that was an interesting uh, uh, comment as to how much the fear mongering had, uh, uh, had blown this out of proportion and wondered if you could speak to that to start this discussion off. Sure. Yeah, the comment that I was making uh, during the talk involved a question that a reporter was asking me from the United States, and I had not yet returned to the U.S. And this was right after Craig Spencer, the doctor in New York, had come down with Ebola, which he had acquired uh, during his trip in Sierra Leone. And we were watching uh, from our laptops in a remote hillside in Liberia, we were watching uh, paranoia really sweep the countryside of the United States, and I knew I would be coming home in about a week, week and a half. And I knew exactly what my role was in Liberia. Uh, the patients knew my role, my fellow workers knew my role, and everybody went about their business normally. What, uh, what happened when, what, what I was concerned about in terms of going home was that the fear that people had about Ebola which was easily visible just from reading the news stories uh, on the internet, uh, was going to then apply to me and that I was going to become an object of derision, possibly violence. I wasn't sure what, what awaited me when I came home. And I think largely my experience when I did come home during the period where I was uh, in active observation, some states did observation, other states did quarantines, uh, really was a, a very anxiety, a very anxiety provoking time. And it really did prove to me that you can get a very warped perception based on what media provides in terms of information and how it chooses to couch the information. Uh, so that instead of lowering anxieties among people that you can actually raise those anxieties. Well, let's get some context. So how bad was Ebola actually in the United States? Well, you know, how many people died? How, how bad was the infection? I mean, we certainly uh, made the headlines. It was uh, on the cover of Time and right. so forth. Uh, and uh, the director of the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Thomas Frieden, uh, had uh, said in a press conference 
for people to calm down a little bit that it was actually hard to transmit the virus. And he had been actually taken to task by a lot of people in the media who felt that he was downplaying the fears, he was being cavalier. And when you actually take a look at what happened in the United States, there was a man in Dallas who was a Liberian. His name was Thomas Eric Duncan. He had returned from Liberia in mid-September of 2014. And a couple of days after he arrived in Dallas, he began to feel ill. After a couple of days, he went to the emergency room at Dallas Presbyterian Hospital, where after waiting around for about an hour, hour and a half, he was evaluated by the medical staff. He'd been sitting out in the open in front of uh, dozens of people. He went through an evaluation where they did not uh, get the triggers that might have isolated him and identified him as a potential Ebola case and do the proper testing. So he was given a diagnosis of a relatively common condition and sent home. He went back home, stayed with his uh, girlfriend and his five children, I believe, in a very small apartment. A couple of days later, as his illness worsened, he called uh, 911 and the emergency uh, technicians took him back. He was then properly identified, isolated, moved around. At the end of all of that, he uh, died on October 8th, about two weeks later. And at the end of all of that, he'd exposed upwards of nearly 200 people at close range. And the total number of people that he actually managed to infect was two. And there wasn't a lot of news media devoted to explaining that story. And that, and that was essentially what Dr. Frieden had said. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so what, what you get was this very asymmetric uh, response in the news media where uh, Dr. Frieden's press coverage was sort of treated with a great deal of skepticism. And yet, when it was really proven that his advice was sound, very few people were actually sort of either owning up themselves and saying, I got this wrong, or saying, you know, Dr. Frieden was right. So how do we put that into a context of uh, what's happening uh, with the media? Now, are, are they wrong to report it? How should, how should they have reacted? What would have been the good story, and what, how, how should we have uh, handled all this? Um, to do a full biopsy on the media response to Ebola is, is a much longer topic and something that I would want to have studied a lot. But what I think there could have been is a couple of simple take-home points that you did see in uh, other media outlets around the world. One thing, for instance, in uh, the coverage of the BBC uh, from Great Britain, was at the end of every news story they did online, they had a series of bullet points about the virus. This is how many people are infected in West Africa. The virus cannot be transmitted by air, which was something that had to get repeated over and over and over again, and yet it was, uh, it was almost like a zombie idea. You just couldn't kill it in the United States. And the, the zombie idea being that it could be. That it could be, and there was an enormous amount of coverage devoted to whether or not this could be an airborne virus. Uh, and uh, the fact that most animals besides uh, primates, chimpanzees, gorillas can get it, but uh, other common house pets in the United States, cats and dogs, can't get it. There was a lot of coverage devoted to whether or not uh, one of the nurses uh, who Thomas Eric Duncan had infected during the course of his illness, she had a, a, a spaniel. And there was a whole enormous amount of media coverage that was devoted to this dog, even though there was no evidence whatsoever uh, that dogs could get it. And yet, over and over and over again, there were stories really asking this question repeatedly, even though the answer was no all the time. And when you have that many stories devoted to a topic for which there's pretty clear evidence that there's no evidence, uh, sorry, there's pretty clear evidence that there's no transmission, you have to wonder why, why do we keep zeroing in and doubling back on these questions all the time? And the conclusion I come away with is that people were really gripped in the vortex of fear, and um, there were particular news media outlets that really fed this. 
I, I wonder, you headed right over there. They, you know, this is your area of, uh, of interest, the, um, these hemorrhagic fevers. And uh, uh, you went right into the vortex without any fear, or, um, or was there fear? Uh, and uh, what was the special knowledge that you had that said, look, I can go and I can, I can learn something from this? I had been to Liberia <coughs> before uh, the outbreak occurred, and I knew people there. And uh, as an infectious disease doctor, my job in life is to treat patients with infections. And so once I saw that the outbreak was taking place, uh, especially among people that I knew and cared for, uh, I felt that I had an obligation to go. Um, I also felt that I could bring some perspective to the care of patients with Ebola that uh, some of the other people uh, who also brought their own areas of expertise, uh, uh, my expertise could complement theirs. Um, most of the people who worked in places uh, like the Ebola treatment units run by Doctors Without Borders, uh, International Medical Corps, uh, the International Rescue Committee, there are a variety of other organizations that set up these ETUs, uh, Ebola treatment units, mm -hmm. um, that they were most, they, a lot of them were uh, emergency physicians. Uh, and as an infectious disease doctor, I thought that I had some skills that could complement that. So uh, I find it fascinating. I, you know, you, you can't tell me enough about these Ebola treatment units, but you're right in the, the middle of the storm there and, uh, and treating these patients and uh, setting up the, 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 the units weren't state of the, they were state of the art, but they were just tents. And uh, it was amazing that you were able to, uh, to provide such care and such primitive, with such uh, primitive tools that you have. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's another point about media coverage is that uh, particularly when you see the coverage of Ebola research in the United States, you always see biosafety level four facilities where... And biosafety level four. Oh, I'm sorry, science. very technical talk yeah, here yeah. is... Uh, but I think actually even, even without fully explaining the term, I, I think viewers Way will high. immediately yeah. unpack. They'll know something that a biosafety level four is really the, where the people walk around in the spacesuits, um, in these very, very high-tech facilities uh, where the rooms are sealed. <clears throat> we didn't have that, and yet we were able to provide care that I think was actually pretty good. And um, obviously, we wanted to have a bigger impact on the mortality. But you, like other things in resource-poor settings, if you uh, have a good... Uh, game plan for how you want to deliver medicine, uh, you can deliver pretty good medicine. And the visual images that you would see during the coverage of the outbreak reinforced some underlying narratives about um, how things were out of control, uh, as opposed to that we had a plan in place and we're getting things under control. So that was the expertise that the uh, emergency uh, guys brought to the uh, to the table, showing how to triage and to uh, and to sequester people, and as and well as the mobilization of the African communities themselves, yeah. I think they probably played the biggest role of all. Is we got people to change their behaviors and we got them to buy into uh, the importance of changing their behavior to to slow the spread of the outbreak. And what we saw in the United States was actually. Um, if not the polar opposite, something that really careened in a very different direction where, um, where there were thousands of actual cases in West Africa uh, and people moderating their behaviors so as to minimize the spread of the disease without the, col the collapse of the structure of society. And yet what you saw in the United States was a hugely disproportionate response to the actual number of cases that were being transmitted because there were only two cases of Ebola that occurred in the United States. Two. <laughs> two. You just say two. It's, it's astounding when, it, when you say the, 
uh, stimulus response is so out of proportion. Yeah. Uh, so having said that, um, how should we respond to uh, some of the more current events? Um, what should we be thinking about something like Zika that's uh, uh, being uh, touted as the next uh, important thing to spend time on? Yeah, I mean, Zika for me has been somewhat distressing to see, again, a, uh, a response that seems to be far out of proportion to what the actual threat is. And when you talk to people about Zika who are not specialists, and you ask them, well, what's, what really is the danger? And people are very vague about it. They know that Zika is menacing, uh, but they don't know precisely what the menace is. Um, Zika's actual threat uh, appears to be uh, that it can cause a birth defect known as microcephaly, where the child is born with a very small head. It uh, uh, happens during the neurological development of the, of the fetus during uh, pregnancy, which means that from what we know, what we know scientifically right now, the people who are most at risk are pregnant women. We also, which means that everybody who is not a pregnant woman or uh, possibly some men who may be with women who can get pregnant, uh, but aside from those two demographics, Zika is really not a terrible virus to anybody else. Uh, a Zika infection causes a mild illness. Um, and for the most part, it's, it's not an exceptionally dangerous virus. There is a, a, an association with this uh, birth defect called microcephaly. And even in Brazil, where there, there are studies that are ongoing right now, the rate appears to be about one in a thousand live births. By contrast, in the United States right now, <clears throat> if you want to take a look at um, a devastating illness that occurs in newborn infants, that has about a one in a thousand live birth uh, incidents. Uh, take a look at fecal, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, which is, uh, occurs when pregnant mothers drink very, very heavily during pregnancy. Uh, and those children end up actually having neurologic complications all as severe. Throughout life, too. That's that, correct, uh, as microcephaly. And yet, we don't, you're, you're not hearing an, uh, a, a news story every single day uh, and an army of people working for the CDC devoted to fetal alcohol syndrome. And so, to me, as I'm watching this coverage, the question is, well, well why aren't you? And I think some of this is this reaction to viruses. And I think at some level, Zika as a uh, phenomenon in the public discourse was really primed by the West African Ebola outbreak because there was so much anxiety over it that all of the public health authorities did not want to be perceived as being uh, asleep at the wheel when, when Zika really uh, came into the public eye. They wanted to make sure that they were doing everything possible to protect the public health. You were talking also about um, some of the uh, the news coverage concerning the mosquitoes, and I thought that was uh, another interesting example of uh, a disproportionate fear mongering in the face of a, a smaller problem. And uh, could you? Uh, <coughs> so it, it relates to what what transmits the Zika virus. So uh, Zika is. Uh, a virus that is transmitted by a mosquito called Aedes aegypti. And there is a related species of mosquito called Aedes albopictus. And it turns out that uh, Aedes aegypti in the United States really occupies the southernmost, hottest parts of the American map. So the border of Texas and Mexico, uh, southern Florida. Uh, albopictus ranges uh, throughout the southern Midwest, uh, on the eastern side of the Mississippi and goes really all the way up until up into Maine. And there have been a couple of stories that have come out saying, uh, well, so Zika might be spread in this relative species. Uh, and 
from there, people have sort of gone in a chain, yeah. right, they've gone in a chain of conclusion so that it gets people very worked up, even though none of this has ever been proven. And people are making guesses on the potential spread of the Zika virus when uh, the, I think the evidence that would support those fears are very, very thin. What I find interesting is that you know, the, the news story will be that here's this mosquito that can transmit it, maybe, and yet it, uh, nobody's seen that. And I have a feeling that in the background, our CDC and our public health departments are, are testing these things on a level that Liberia never saw. <laughs> and uh, the, the, uh, the title of your book, A Snowball and a Blizzard, that uh, says we, we have a lot less to fear because we've got governmental structures and uh, public health infrastructure that really does protect us. And uh, one of the other um, points that you made in your lecture had to do with saying that uh, when you devoted all this energy to Ebola, that you were uh, detracting from other things happening. Can you just uh, go over those those points that you made? Uh, there's a lot in that question. Um, I, what, my first reaction as you were talking about it uh, was to actually, uh, what made me think about it was the amount of press coverage devoted to the dog story about this, about this dog. And um, that by asking the question itself, you get people focused on something that really shouldn't, that wasn't necessary to be in the public eye in the first place. Um, in terms of uh, the the broader question, I, th I I think what my concern about with Ebola is, and and Zika as well, and as you noted in your introduction, um, other scares that have come along, SARS. Uh, um, the H1N1 is a little bit different because I think that was really a, a potential yeah. genuine threat and we did not know how serious it would be at the time. I think anytime you, you have a flu uh, strain that could be deadly, I think, it is, I think caution is appropriate. But, uh, but, but yet there's always sort of a, a virus du jour. Um, in addition to that, there was, there was one a couple of years ago called the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which was called MERS. And it, it never quite got the popularity of either Zika or Ebola, but, but it was in the news uh, last year at this time. And when people get worked up over these viruses, several of which can be relatively trivial threats, what, they, what, what happens is you get this difference in risk perception. And so people are, uh, uh, during the outbreak, were very, very scared in the United States even in Dallas, where there were actual cases of Ebola, there were plenty of people in Dallas who were incredibly anxious about acquiring the Ebola virus, and yet the double cheeseburger that they ate <laughs> that morning was actually much more dangerous to them in the long run, um, or for that matter, the car that they got into, uh, which as a statistical matter, going from point A to point B in any major metropolitan city, you know that there are a certain number of accidents that are going sure. to happen, some of which are going to be quite serious. Um, in a nation of 300 million people, there were two Ebola infections. A lot of people died during that time from heart attacks. A lot of people died from lung cancer, which are the, due to the effects of smoking. A lot of people died uh, from uh, gunshots. Um, and uh, a lot of people died from uh, heart attacks. And yet, we get this very dramatic uh, warping of our perception of what actually represents a real harm to us in life. And I think that's actually quite sad because you can do something about modifying your lifestyle decisions, but people don't really, I think, get that message as purely and in as undistilled a manner as they could, and everybody gets focused on what are relatively trivial threats. So getting back to uh, Liberia and talking about what happened when they focused on Ebola, uh, you made the comment in, in your lecture that uh, because of that, the focus was away from measles vaccines and so forth, and that actually more people might have been hurt by that than were helped by the focus on Ebola. Yeah. 
The um, well, that I, to me, the the point I was making is one of the one of the real ironies in um, the discourse around viruses is that um, there is a a group in the United States that's very resistant to the idea that vaccines of any kind, but uh, in particular the measles vaccine, um, which is part of a, a group of vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, so that it, they all get put together uh, in the modern vaccine. And there are people who think that uh, that increases the risk of a variety of maladies. Most, most commonly, they, they talk about autism. And what happened at the time is in Liberia, the entire health system shut down. And as a consequence, nobody could get vaccinated for measles. And a couple of researchers at Princeton took a look at this and made estimates based on how deadly measles is, which it's not very deadly, but it spreads like wildfire. And so what they discovered was, in a place where you shut down the healthcare system and routine vaccinations in an area of 22 million people, you could actually end up with as many people dying from measles as the number of people who had actually died from Ebola at that point. Um, and I think, again, it showed in some ways that measles is really sort of the mirror image of Ebola, that Ebola is very deadly to a person uh, if they would get it. But really, when you looked at the 22 million people in the three affected countries, it turned out to be, I mean, a horrible epidemic of um, uh, unprecedented proportions. But on the other hand, uh, measles can be deadly in large groups, even if it's not necessarily deadly to a person. And that is based on the transmission dynamics. Steve, I imagine that we could go on for another hour with uh, your wealth of knowledge and personal experience is second to none. And you've been an absolutely fabulous guest. I want to thank you for coming here to Physician Focus. Uh, uh, and maybe we can get you back some other time to talk about some of these issues. Great. Thanks for having me. For more information on infectious diseases, visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines and when taken under a doctor's supervision provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Frank McMillan. And I'm Dr. Raj Devarajan. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, claiming more than 50,000 lives each year. The cancer occurs in the colon and rectum, parts of the large intestine, and is caused by growths called polyps that can turn into cancer. Screening for colorectal cancer saves lives, but 23 million American adults, about one in three, don't get screened as recommended. Colorectal cancer affects men and women, and the, high, and the risk rises with age and a family history of the disease. If you're over 50 or have a family history of the disease, early screening is recommended. Screening can reduce the risk of colon colorectal cancer by up to 90% by finding and removing the growths before they turn into cancer. For more information on colorectal cancer and the different screening tests available, visit the American College of Gastroenterology.